Hi there. Welcome to the Humanistic Podcast. Today on our podcast, we've got Lynette Palmer. Lynette, welcome to the podcast. Hi, sir. Well, uh, thank you for having me. Excellent. Well, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, Vinay, um, your background um, and, uh, you know, where you are today? So, uh, Vinay is uh, a name of Indian origin. Um, my family is Gujarati. We're from the Gujarat part of India. Um, my father was an immigrant from Kenya. He came to the UK in 1967. Went off to marry my mother in 74, and I was born in 75 in Harrow in Middlesex. Um, and then he had the bright idea of starting a business with his brother, elder brother, which uh, started off great. They had a great business in the middle of Birmingham in a place called Spark Brook. We had a, a grocery business that was one of the first to really bring imported sp- imported spices and pickles directly from India, catering very much to the uh, Indian market. So we had that business for a number of years. And, and like all good family stories, it ended in a bit of a feud. They stopped talking to each other for many, many years. But thankfully, towards the end of my uncle's life, they did start talking again and reconciled. So that it ended in a nice way. But yeah, so that that's kind of my kind of background. I, I grew up one of three boys. Uh, I also have a younger sister. I work a group of uh, three boys. We grew up in, in Tisley in Birmingham um, and moved into Hall Green. And I've been living in Solly Hall now for the last 20 years, 20, 20 plus years. Um, for most of my married life, I've been living in Solly Hall. Um, and my career, I guess, started by accident, really. Um, I was a, I was I was always quite bright in terms of understanding stuff, but my my attention span and my focus was always my my challenge. And um, growing up, I loved cricket. So um, during my last year of the, the exam years at school, I focused way too much on cricket, played way too much cricket, and didn't really put the time and attention into studying. So I failed all my GCSEs. I think I came out with seven Ds and an E. And the E I got was in home economics. I mean, who gets an E in home economics? It's, it's cookery, come on. Um, so I did terribly. And all of my friends had done really well, gone off to do their A-levels. Um, I had to retake some of my GCSEs, maths and English and, and, and what like. Um, and I think something happened there where my friends went off to go and do their own thing. Uh, you know, they were, by the time I'd retaken it, they were in the second year of A-levels and thinking about university. And a bit of a gap started to appear in terms of what was relatable between what they were going through and what I was going through. And I was also searching for what what is it that I really want to do because I didn't have a clear idea of where I wanted to go. You know, my parents thankfully weren't the typical parents of you must be a doctor, you must be a lawyer, you must be an accountant kind of thing. So they were quite open to what I wanted to be, but I just didn't know. I, I had a passion for art, so I wanted to follow that. So I decided to do um, a BTEC diploma in graphic design. But about three three to six, so I did the first year, then started the second year. About three years in, uh, sorry, three months in. Um, I just got sick of drawing naked old men because there was lots of um, life drawing involved in it. And so I lost interest. Um, and then I had an auntie um, who worked in a bank and she was a really good friend of my mom's. So not so much an auntie by blood, but an auntie by relationship. And um, she was like, well, look, there's some, a part-time role in the bank that I work for. If you if you want to come and do that, maybe you can study part-time and come and work. So I, I did. I um. I I, uh, I took a role in that bank. Uh, I worked there for four years. I had a great time. Um, really found my, I suppose it started as a part-time role, but as I got more into it, I really found I enjoyed working with people. I enjoyed being part of a team. I felt like I found a place that I belonged in terms of the work that I was doing. And it, and it also quenched my thirst for a bit of curiosity. So it was the first time that I, like, I, I was, I've always been good at building relationships and making friends, right? But it was the first time in a work environment, probably a full-time proper working environment, where um, my kind of thirst for understanding the bigger picture really started to come through. Um, And I started to go to other departments that I wouldn't normally interface with to figure out what they did. Because, you know, I was taking credit card applications on a phone, so the application would come through. But I always wondered what happened next, and then what happened, and then what happened. So well, how does the paperwork get here? And how does the card get sent? And what happens when that happens? So I had this, I wanted to just understand it because for me, being able to see the big picture and how things connect is really important because when you can see all the interdependencies, you also see the opportunities and you see the possibilities. 
so that's kind of been a pattern in my career. Um, and then I went on to move on from that bank, which was HFC. Um, the same auntie that got me to HFC Bank um, lived over in the Black Country, and um, she got she um, heard about a new bank that was starting by Prudential, and um, she basically strong armed me into applying for a role there. Um, so much so that she gave me an application form. A couple of weeks later, she chased me up on it to say how I filled it in. And I told her that, nah, I hadn't bothered and I'd thrown it in the bin. So she got me another one and she made me fill it in. And she made me post it. So I did. And thankfully, I got an interview uh, and I got a role there. And it was just, it was, and that was an amazing place, you know, from a, from a, uh, you know, I was, I was in my early 20s then, probably just turned 21, 22. And it was a startup type environment. It was a new bank. It was an amazing culture. And the things that I would learn there, the things I was exposed to around leadership, and customer focus and building teams and all of that kind of stuff was was in, was incredible and it really crafted and set set for me some real clear thinking patterns that have influenced my work um going forward so yeah i was there for two stints a total of 10 years in total um and then i then i was freelancing for a little while um for about 10 years as a consultant a freelance consultant and then I ended up being hired to speak at National Express's conference in 2015, um, just a session on customer experience. And um, it, it went really well. And we were engaged in a, I partnered with another consultancy, a friend of mine who ran a consultancy called Customer Whisperers. And um, we partnered together to do this. And as part of that, we were engaged to do a piece of work, which turned into an interim assignment, um, which was supposed to be for three months. Then it turned into six. And then after six, um, they just wanted me to stay. So we had a great conversation about joining during the business, you know, the, and um, yeah, so I ended up staying there with the intention of being there for a couple of years, but ended up being eight years. Um, and I just exited in July this year. And so what's what's next for you? Uh, so I, I took August off after leaving in July, I just needed some time out. And then in September, I started to really think about what I wanted to do. Did I want to go back into another executive job or did I want to do something different? Um, and when I was freelancing the first time, I, I had this thing about wanting to really bring the power of customer experience and leadership into organizations. And it felt like unfinished business. And so um, I decided to set up another consultancy, um, this time more than me. This time it would be you know very much focused on the CX, bringing loads more experience that I had over the years to really help companies to not just unleash the power of customer experience, but also to understand the commerciality of it, to be able to join it to the bottom line. And I think that's where sometimes companies struggle. They think it's a nice to have, they don't see the value in it necessarily. Um, and so being able to really help companies to see how you can thread CX into your business or how it should be a part of your course, course strategy, it should be a thing that you do in addition, because it really drives value into your business is, is a thing that I'm really passionate about. Um, so I decided to hatch an idea to build something around that. And what am I now? Nine and a half weeks, maybe 10 weeks in. Um, just been really focused on delivering, uh, you know, in, in I guess, defining the story, doing all the things when you when you have a new business. Um, most importantly, I think, cutting away things that I don't do. Because I think sometimes when you come with so much a breadth of experience, you can have so much that you can do. But that clarity about this is the thing that I'm now doing. And yes, I've got those things in my locker. If things come along, we can we can do those. But really, that clarity of chopping away the things that are distraction, and being clear on what I want. So that's been quite an interesting, quite an interesting journey. That's really fascinating to hear. You talked obviously about how now CX is your passion, and it's a really interesting career path to get to there. Was there like a defining moment for you, whether it's a story, a person? or something that happened, because when you started out, you mentioned you weren't entirely clear on, you know, the career path you wanted to take, and whereas today you're really passionate about CX. Is there yeah. a story or a moment where you felt, this is it, this is what I'm passionate about, and this is what I'd like to dedicate the rest of my time to? Yeah, I think there, there are two significant, I mean, there are, only everyone's after lots of significant moments, but there are two that really stand out to me that probably shaped who I am today more than anything else. So the first one was, um, uh, the first one that we've already talked about was was working at Egg, being part of that culture, being exposed to that at such a young age, being part of that whole customer-focused business and really learning 
uh, and understanding what it's like to be in a company with a real with a real clarity of what they were trying to deliver, revolution the market, revolutionize the market they were in, and just the whole approach was really was really um, striking for me. And I think from a professional perspective, that's probably created for me a lot of the frameworks and ideas that I, that I share going forward. But more so on a personal level, um, when I was when I was I got married when I was twenty five. Um, so my wife and I met in nineteen ninety nine. And um, like, you know, all good Indian weddings, um, you look for the most auspicious occasion to have the wedding on. So my mom had been to see three different priests to negotiate what date this wedding would be on, had the stars aligned perfectly, and was it an auspicious day? And they picked the 9th of July, 2000, as the, that would be the day. Um, and everything was going great. You know, we were having all the, the, the all the build up to the wedding. My mom was super happy that I was finally getting married and, as she puts it at the time, you know, I was going to sort my life out. Um, but unfortunately, um, she died on my wedding day. She contracted meningitis. And what turned out as a, a rash on her body in the morning of the wedding, and she was rushed to the hospital, and they thought that it might just be you know, chicken pox or measles or something. They didn't quite know what it was. By the end of the day, by the time I got back, because I didn't know what was happening at the hospital, she was very clear with my dad. She was still conscious. In, in the beginning and saying to my dad don't tell him what's going on because if you tell him what's going on he'll leave and he'll just come so don't don't tell him so my dad um was at the hospital with my mom my brothers left the wedding I didn't notice that they'd gone at the time um and it was only when the wedding was over the ceremony was over that my best friend was there and he'd um, he'd been waiting for me and he rushed me to one side he said we've got to go you need to go and see your mom she's not well and we went straight to the hospital and by the time I got there <clears throat> She was in a life support machine. Excuse me. Her organs had failed. Um, she was pretty much brain dead. And so the first decision I had to make as a married man, um, still in my wedding outfit with my bride beside me, was um, to switch off her life support machine. And um, that was quite a, as you can imagine, a difficult time. 25 years old, you know, two younger siblings, a, a sister, my, my, my dad were in, in pieces. So I grew up pretty quick um in that scenario but from a and the reason i tell that is not for sympathy or anything like that because people have tragic things happen in their life but for me it was that sliding doors moment because that started the journey and changed my belief system about life about there is no script things don't happen the way they're meant to they just happen the way they do and then i went on this whole journey of personal development inward reflection I was never really a reader at school, but I started to read more about human psychology, neuroscience, how the mind, brain works, why people do what they do. This whole curiosity came, understanding human emotion um, and what drives us in, in that aspect. And that started to shape my work. So those two key experiences are probably the core, the nebulous um, of what's really got me to where I am today. And I like the, I love the story and the takeaway, although it was quite a difficult event. And as you said, 25 did go through an experience like that. And, and I think having that growth mindset and the ability to reflect back and say that was actually defiling because it could actually be quite a quite a long grief period for a lot of people. And you know, I know mm. people look back 25 years ago and, and so uh, it's really incredible, you know, how 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 that shaped your journey going forward. Um, thank, thank you for sharing that with us. Now I think it's, it's a really, really interesting insight um, in, into how major life events can shape people and how they yeah. think, think about the future. Keep going. So I was, I was, I was just going to say, I think the other, the other thing that it did was it started to take away some of those, I guess, I wouldn't say all fears, but I started to relate to life differently in that, you know, everyone that you meet is just a human being right? We're all the same. We're all going to the same destination. It's this really bizarre thing about you can't embrace life fully until you first embrace death. When you become comfortable with death and you realize that this journey is a fragile journey that could end at any, at any particular time and you have that mindset, you start to connect with people differently. You start to see people differently. And so rather than being intimidated by people's job titles, and what they did, I saw beyond that and just connected to the human being. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think in, in that kind of way, those kind of intimidationary type or feeling 
intimidated by those kind of things kind of suppressed for me. I'm not saying that I never do get intimidated by things because we all do, you know. Uh, but I think that was the journey of peeling away the layers that actually behind all of this, it's another human being. Um, so yeah, I think that was a that was a, a sort of an interesting experience to kind of to get into. Fascinating way to look at that uh, that situation, and I think you know, great that you could you could take all that positivity uh, away from that. There's another one I wanted to pick up on, which I think is really interesting, and I think not many people go through that journey. And, um, you, you know, you, like me, have had the luxury of being both a freelancer and doing things by yourself and working in the big corporate machine. Um, I'd be really keen to hear your perspective on where the intersections, where things are, you know, very similar in those two things and where they're very different. And, and how, if someone was looking to make that move, that they adapt, you know, because it's a very different world being a freelancer, where you call the shorts, et cetera. And then going and working in a bigger corporate environment, it's, it's almost diagonal, right? In how people see those careers, you know, people are the career freelancers or the type of career corporate people. Just really interested in your views, you know, how you adapted and what are the kind of the key traits you would look for for somebody to move into either of those stages, really? Yeah, I mean, I'm a great advocate that I think at some point everybody should try and run a business. Like, I just think it's something that everybody should do. And the reason I say that is, is that I think when you when you work for yourself or you run your own business or your own venture, whatever way you want to put it, you become more entrepreneurial in your thinking. So when you're in an organization, you start to you stop seeing silos and you stop seeing boundaries and you start to start to see, well, we just need to connect things together because you know, as an as when you're running your own thing, you haven't got time to worry about boundaries and silos and stuff. You just need to bring things together. So I think that collaborative um, drive, um, that entrepreneurial mindset, that um, also that the understanding and the value that when you've when you've been in your own business and you've been the HR director, the sales director, the operations director, you've done all of those things. You start to really appreciate the value um, of having. You know, when you're in a corporate organization, you start to a I appreciate the value and did it with for yourself, but you also, when you're in an organization, you see uh, like how hard it is um, to do those things. So you have a different appreciation um, for the, for, for those functions. And, and and I think you then start to be able to challenge from a different place too. Um, and I think sometimes when you've just grown up in a corporate bubble and you've just done the job, you don't see the bigger picture. You don't see how the interdependencies work. And sometimes it can be quite a transactional thing that you, it ends up being. So you don't, you don't always connect with the work that you do. So I think those are, are really important kind of experiences from one to the other. In terms of adapting, um, I guess I guess I was, I would say I was lucky a little bit at National Express that I had a really good um, sponsor in, in the CEO in terms of um, him wanting me to come on board and the relationship that we developed over the, the eight years and, you know, his listening for the things I was saying. Um, we didn't always agree. He didn't always put his hand in his pocket and back me, but he always understood and we had a mutual respect of what we were trying to achieve. Um, so I think, I think the, the adopt, the adaption comes from, you know, almost, like I said, you were more entrepreneurial, but you know, it's, it's the, when you work in a big environment, it's the, the frameworks and the governance and somebody else setting the agenda and somebody else setting the rules. Um, it's quite, a, it's quite an adjustment to wait when you go back in there. But being able to stand in that position and still challenge from the right place, not just challenge for the sake of challenging, but challenging from the right intent, I think that's really that's really a strong a strong thing to do. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful insight. And uh, I always joke I, I started my career off as a freelancer, like then I moved into setting a corporation. I always joke that uh, I set up a company just because I needed friends. And it can be incredibly, it can be an incredibly lonely career as a freelancer, like you said. You're everything. You're the finance director. You're the sales. Yeah, director. yeah. And uh, you know, yeah. so I think you know. I think it's it's. But my agree totally. I think you know, uh, as as a, as, a, as as a corporation trying to bias towards people who either run their own business or being a freelancer, 
I think is a, is, is a good selection criteria in terms of the type of people you want to bring across. Yeah. But we, you know, I talk a lot about high agency leaders, and I think that's the classic example of somebody who's been a freelancer or on their own business, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be just by themselves. It can be a small business. Yeah. So that sort of high agency behaviors, which I think are important. Um, yeah. We obviously, we're obviously a tech consultancy, so I can't uh, avoid asking you about technology, especially <laughs> given how passionate we all are about, you know, how technology can enhance human life. Um, are there any, any specific tech tools or innovations um, that for you have had a significant impact in your life, you know, whether it be today or in the past? Uh, like, I just love tech. I'm just, I'm just drawn to gadgets. My wife is forever you know, banging ahead against a brick wall. It's like, you bought another gadget. Why do you need, why do you need this now? So I just, I love technology. I think my, uh, you know, my early day exposure to to working in an online bank, I guess, at the time has kind of shaped some of that thinking. Um, so what do I use? So I've discovered things like Otter AI, which has been transformative in taking meeting notes. Normally I'd be there scribbling on my iPad, trying to keep up with what's going on. And actually, being able to fully focus on the conversation, having something else transcribe it, and then not only transcribe it, but you're able to then interrogate that data by creating summaries, follow-up emails, pulling out key actions. I mean, it has been, I've been using it for about a month now, uh, and it's been, it's been brilliant. So I think that's been great. I use Calendly to do all of my scheduling and, and meetings with people. So I think that's, that's been really good, you know, things like Zoom and and, and Google Meets and, and Teams, obviously, those kind of things. Um, but I think just generally, I'm just quite a, a connected tech person. So, you know, I have a I have a smart watch which tracks my steps and my heart rate. And when I do get around to working out, tracks my workouts. And then I have, you know, my, my phone's kind of like, I think if I lost my phone, I'd feel like I've lost my arm because all of my apps are on there. So I, I tend to use voice notes and things to capture my thoughts. So you know what it's like, it's like, um, I get have some of my best ideas when I'm going out for a walk or I'm doing something that's not related to what work or I'm in the shower, but I don't take my phone in the shower. <laughs> but if I'm in, in the shower, that those ideas come. So having a quick ability to use something like voice recording or transcribing just to capture those. I've also been using ChatGTP a lot to help structure ideas and to bring some of those things in there. So, I, you know, it gives me a, it gives me a fast start. So if I'm writing a, if I'm writing an article or a blog or something, I'll know the three or four key things that I want to put in there. And that I'll ask him, I'll ask chat him or ask it to create me a framework. And it gives me a, a fast start, you know, 60% of the work is done and then I can build on it. Whereas I know that if it was me just working on my own, I'd probably sit down, think about what I'm going to write, then think, oh, I'll go and make myself a cup of tea. And then I'd come back and then I'd start the first line and then I'd overanalyze it and become my own worst critic. So before you know it, you know, three or four hours have gone by and you haven't even started anything. Whereas this gives you such a, a speedy start that you can then build on that it, it helps your productivity from a, a pace and progression perspective. So I use ChatGTP all the time. My house is full of um, smart speakers and smart lights and all of that stuff. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's a it's a, just a key part of my life. You know, I just I love how technology facilitates innovation. Um, you know, we've been lucky to be part of this generation. I remember when the first iPhone came out um, on the, it was a 2G and edge network back then with O2, right? And I remember queuing for my first iPhone. And I remember my journey from PC to Mac and all of those things that, but you know, now it's just taken for granted. It's just so connected that all of my data is everywhere at the same time. I can, if I'm out and about, I don't have to worry about, oh, that file's on my desktop. No, it's not. It's in the cloud, and I can just pull it down, and it can be wherever I am. So, yeah, they're all great. I actually have an interesting barometer to test whether people are tech savvy or not. And actually, one of the questions I ask a lot of people, certainly in my personal life and stuff, is, did you queue for the first iPhone? And I think if someone says they, they said they didn't queue for the first iPhone, and I think that kind of says a lot about that person and how tech savvy they are. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I think it's interesting because I, I was the same. I queued for the first iPhone uh, when when it launched, and I think it kind of defines kind of that generation of tech savvy uh, people. Really, there was an interesting yeah. point you made, made there, though. You know, because you've been through a couple of these journeys around entrepreneurialism and freelancing. 
Do you think with where technology is now, you know, you've given some great examples like Hotel, ChatGPT, etc. It's become so much easier to start your own business and be an entrepreneur than say even, you know, a decade or two decades ago, where a lot of the things that, you know, we would kind of, I guess, take for granted today were tedious, expensive, and, and really friction-oriented before. And, and do you think that's, that's made it easier for you now to start uh, your own, own enterprise right now? I, I think it's certainly removed the barriers to entry, for sure. You know, like being able to spin up a website, you know, relatively cheaply, um, have it hosted, have, you know, things like that done. Your social media channels are super quick. I mean, uh, you know, you arguably now have some businesses don't even need a website because they exclusively work on social media, you know, so that, that even, that even now that's questionable. It's the same kind of the, the, it's the, it's almost the transition from the bricks and mortar businesses to moving online. to now it's kind of like, well, it's click bricks and clicks, but it's now just clicks. And then you're moving on to something else. Right. So you've got this whole, You've got this evolution happening, so it's certainly it's def it's certainly it's removed the barriers. I don't know whether it's become easier uh, because I still think the challenge in the business is that crystallization of your idea, understanding what problem you're trying to solve. So you've got more tools to help you get there, but I I think what it's done it's moved out some of the distractions that used to take you longer to get done, so you can really focus in um, on, on doing this. So yeah, I think if people are starting an enterprise or a business today, they can get a fast start much, you know, and they can be up and running much quicker than, um, than somebody else, you know, just, just things like, you know, being able to use Shopify to set up a, uh, an online, an online shop for you to sell your products. You know, some people, um, use the Amazon marketplace. I know to, to sell their products, if they're selling physical products and stuff, drop shipping and all of those things have, have taken away some of those, some of those barriers. Um, so that's why I say digital has facilitated transformation. It's facilitated making things easier for sure. That's a really interesting point, Jamil. And you talked earlier about how you spent a lot of your early years trying to learn about human psychology, you know, in the CX space, etc. I guess it goes back to that point that yes, the technology might have made things simpler and faster, but the core tenets of running a business, you know, having the vision, the resilience, the great, uh, the creativity, et cetera, which are almost fundamentally human skills. And um, you, you can't take that away, right? You can't, you know. Yeah, like, you can't. Ch Ch Chat GPT can help you crystallize what is effectively your vision and your thinking. But, you know, if you just sign with a blank state and, and start with Chat GPT and you get it to write your business plan for you, it's not going to work. And I think that's a no. really important point because, and that's why, you know, we talk about human technology because we believe technology is there to accelerate where humans are going, but not necessarily replace them. I know there's a lot yes. of fear, fear with chat GPT and AI around, you know, replacing humans. Um, okay, maybe then, you know, um, general intelligence comes through artificial general intelligence, which is, you know, probably decades away, I, you know, or not, depending on what the folks of open AI are doing. So I think that, 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 that that's a really interesting kind of juxtaposition around, um, like you said, it's really interesting, and I agree with you, that it's not necessarily easier to start a business because that that courage and that and that, and that leap you have to take uh, uh, to, to just go and set up a business doesn't change, yeah. irrespective of which era you're in, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I posted... Um... I linked in a couple of days ago, old diagram that I found from my days at Egg. Um, and it just had this really simple drawing of the rock of reliability over here, the, the desired future here, and the person standing in the middle. And the challenge is that across that spectrum, the further away from the rock of reliability you go, the higher your level of anxiety increases. And so, you know, your fear and all of those kind of challenges come to fore. And I, I go back to the experience that I had after my mum died. It was that that was the kind of, it almost blew up the blueprint of what life should be. Because when you've been through that, you know, there's some other things that happen in my life as well that further further completed that is that it's there is no plan. There is no script, right? That rock of reliability is a figment of your imagination. Um, you know, we've been taught that these structures here give you security, but actually uh, we've then become so attached to them that breaking away from them, it, 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 become, it becomes really hard. And that's the, that's the challenge, the human challenge of breaking away from that the known, the certainty, the security that you you think you have versus going for the future and the desired outcomes that you want in life. And I think that's the continual challenge 
as a human being and, and technology can help you journal it, it can help you document it, it can help you research it, but it's a human experience that it can never replace. Really, that's a really good point. And interestingly, you talk about challenges. I know this year is a big year of change, lots of excitement for you. Um, what's the best thing that happened happened to you this year? And conversely, what's the biggest challenge you've had to face this year? Uh, I think they're both the same thing. So it's two sides of the same coin. So the best thing that happened to me was leaving National Express in July, not because I didn't enjoy working there, but I'd been there eight years. I'd probably been there a little bit too long. And I was getting to the I was getting to the point where I wasn't bringing the best of myself every day. You know, I set myself high standards. Other people looking at me might not have might not think, "What do you mean you weren't bringing the best of yourself?" Because you know what I what I bring, I bring. But internally, I felt like I just wasn't being the best that I could be. And um, so I was deliberating: should I stay? Should I go? Should I stay? So the circumstances are such. You know, there's a restructure, and my role went as a result of the restructure, took the band-aid off for me. And, you know, the universe answered with the, well, if you're not going to decide, I'm going to decide for you, right? So that's the, that in, in a way, that was the best thing that happened to me. But the transition from being in a corporate environment for that period of time to coming out, to getting used to working for yourself again, despite all these tools that we've spoken about, but the mental transition from suddenly your structure is different. Nobody else is organizing your diary. You're now, you're now in command of that blank page, focusing on the right things. So that transitional piece of, you know, my phone not ringing every five minutes from, a, from my PA or my team, or there's not a crisis to suddenly put out that I've got to jump into. So it's just a different, it's a different space, right? So you, you're kind of growing into a new structure. Um, you know, I, I saw uh, years ago, um, it's a metaphor that I use a lot, there was um, a program on the Discovery Channel and it was about this guy, uh, I think his name was D, not Steve Irwin, but he was, anyway, he was a snake guy. So he would jump around the jungle, putting his hands into holes, pulling out snakes and, you know, doing stupid things like that, which I just, I really could never stick my hand down a hole and, and try and grab a snake. I don't know why anybody would do that. But, but he was doing that. And in this one episode, he happened to be in the Amazon. And he was explaining the ecology of the Amazon and talking about these trees that were hundreds and hundreds of years old that were growing around. And, and often what would happen, you know, suddenly one of those trees would die and when it died, it would fall. And because of the size of these trees, they created quite a lot of devastation when they fell. So, you know, small animals might get caught underneath it or the foliage underneath, you know, the plants that have been growing, which is, would, would, would be, you know, would be harmed. Sometimes people might get in the way and somebody might die. And then he said, well, you know, you can you can be sad that that hundred year old tree has died and we can we can go, oh, my God, what a horrible thing to happen. But actually, the space that it's then cleared in the sky has created a clearing and that clearing allows light to focus on the smaller plants that were in the shadow of this tree. So they can now grow and they can grow into what used to be that skyline and so on and so forth. And the cycle comes along. And so I think, you know, it, it goes back to that embracing death. You're almost embracing death. You're moving out of that organization, embracing that it's over. You go through a period of grieving, whatever it is, you know, uh, and letting go of those old structures and what was and embracing the new um, and what can be. And I think that's just an interesting human journey. That's a, that's a fascinating look into that perspective, really, about um, embracing death. And I've never really thought of it like that. And that's a great anecdote in there. And a way to think about life, isn't it? Not not just death, but also life. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, you know your 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 background, those interesting insights. Uh, we always like to end by asking uh, our podcast guests to kind of share their one big piece of advice. Um, so can you tell us one big thing that you'd like to share with our listeners, whether it's about business, technology, life? It doesn't matter, but something, you know, a piece of advice that stuck with you and hopefully, you know, will be very really useful for our listeners. Sure. Um, I think what I've grown to understand is that whatever your business you're in, you're in the people business. And your skill set about how to connect people to one another and connect them to a vision and an idea is the difference between success and failure, whatever vocate, whatever you look at, whether it's business, whether it's sport, whether it's family, having a clear 
North Star, having a clear vision and idea of what it is that you want to have, that desired place you want to go to, is the first step. And then your ability to connect people to that is huge because you can have the best tech in the world, you can have the most beautiful office, you can have the wonderfully documented processes, but if you don't have people engaged and enrolled in what you're doing, um, you know, there's lots of talk at the moment about um, presenteeism at work and people working remotely and all that. But if you don't have people engaged in your in what it is you're trying to do, then you're never going to be successful. So that whole focus on people and it links back to the whole reason I started the consultancy that I started, although it's CX, it's still built around people and delivering that. And the name Druva, uh, Druva Star, Druva is a story of a young boy who was turned into the North Star. And that's why I named the business Druva Star, because it is about giving people that that focal point, that North Star, here's where we're heading, and then helping them communicate that and engage in their business to drive out those results. So the thing I would finish on is whatever business you're in, you're in the people business. Brilliant piece of advice, Vinay. Thank you. Vinay, thank you so much for taking the time to share your views and your background with us. Um, I wish you all the best with your new venture. Um, and... Uh, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi there. Welcome to the Humanistic Podcast. Today on our podcast, we've got Lynette Palmer. Lynette, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Well, uh, thank you for having me. Excellent. Well, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, Lynette? Um, 